All right, thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you all for, for coming. I know day three here. Uh, there will be some giveaways involved for questions at the end, so do keep that in mind as we run through this. Uh, so just some quick background about myself uh, and about the company. So my name is Mitch Smiley. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm heading up marketing at Animal Jam, focusing on digital first uh, user acquisition. We do a lot of, obviously, offline brand efforts as well, but primarily uh, digital is our focus. Contact information here. Uh, I'll have this available at the end. The slides will be available uh, for download, and I can also shoot them to you directly if you're interested. So feel free to take pictures or notes if you're into that, but otherwise we can, uh, we can send that out afterwards. And if you're curious, this is what I look like in Animal Jam. This is my hyena. <laughs> so for those of you unfamiliar with the game, Animal Jam is a browser-based online game. It's our flagship property. Uh, we also have a mobile version that came out last August that uh, I'll get into a little bit more later. Uh, we're currently the number one online social game for kids in the U.S. So after some of our competitors have kind of fallen off in uh, recent years and we've continued to grow. We just hit 50 million registered users worldwide, so uh, primarily US-based, but we've done some uh, global expansion as well. And our, our core demo is girls about age 7 to 12. The uh, game has been out since 2010, so some of our user base has gotten a little bit older as time goes by, but that's kind of our core audience. So the problem we're trying to solve uh, that I'm sure we all share and commiserate with is that uh, for how do we run a successful ROI-positive uh, user acquisition campaign for kids with all the regulations that come with COPA, et cetera, um, when we can't do any remarketing, any behavioral targeting, which are two of the most uh, powerful tools we have available to us as digital marketers. So we're all pretty familiar with COPA, so I won't spend a ton of time here, but the FTC's defined goal is that uh, COPA exists to place uh, parents in control over what information is collected about their children who are defined as kids that are under 13 uh, online. Uh, how it affects digital UA, so like I mentioned, no behavioral targeting or remarketing, which are you know, two uh, great tools available to us as marketers when we're not talking about kids, but since we are, it does uh, provide a lot of limitations. Um, I recommend working with a third party to verify uh, compliance. I know that the Kids Safe uh, program is a great one. We personally use uh, the Better Business Bureau's Children's Advertising Review Unit, or CARU, so they kind of vet our site once a year to make sure our privacy, our, our privacy policy is, uh, is correct and that we're you know, in compliance with everything. So that's something I strongly recommend doing. Uh, and with all that said, the under 13 kids uh, media market digitally is poised to go over two and a half billion dollars in spend in just a couple of years. So obviously we're talking about a lot of money on the table. We need to make sure we're spending effectively. So, so how do we do that? So just to outline a quick digital strategy, some of the building blocks I recommend putting in place. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide, mostly talking about how uh, tweens and, and the teens, kids are spending more time on screen devices, uh, computers, tablets, mobile phones, uh, and less time on TV as they get older. So they're spending a continually increasing amount of time with their screen devices, uh, less on TV. So obviously the point being that the digital UA is going to continue to be more important for us. So my background actually comes from uh, kind of the conversion optimization and analytics and tracking side of things uh, from the agency side. So this is something I'm pretty passionate about that's very important to do for any UA program. But first and foremost, make sure that you're measuring your results. Uh, and that involves on the front end making sure you have an effective web analytics program set up. Uh, I personally use Google Analytics for a lot of things. That's what we use at Animal Jam. Adobe has a great platform as well. It just kind of depends on where you are. Uh, obviously, GA has a free version that's available to, to everybody to use. So. Just make sure that you're tracking you know, basic things like uh, conversion goals. So you're setting up you know, not only when somebody signs up to play your game, but you're measuring quality with things like you know, gameplay timers, uh, purchases, things like that. So you have a little bit more of a measuring stick for your traffic. An attribution model. So I'm not sure how much experience everyone has with this. Uh, as an industry, we've been all talking about it and trying to move on from last click, last click attribution for quite a few years now. That being said, it's still the default model that's used by most analytics platforms, including Google Analytics. So this gives 100% of the credit to the most recent click on a conversion that ends up coming to your site, which is not usually accurate of how the actual customer journey happens. Uh, for a kid's game, we're not talking about selling cars or some big ticket item, so there's probably not a lot of touch points in that funnel. Uh, but that being said, we do see typically a few. We have, like I mentioned, some offline media. Uh, then a kid might see an ad on YouTube or online, uh, end up searching for a branded keyword related to Animal Jam or a game, and then so they'll end up converting via uh, a branded keyword ad, but really there was two or three touch points along the, that journey before they actually converted. So it's really easy to set that up in GA. Uh, you can assign credit to each source in the process accordingly. So 
you know, 20% here, 10% there. So something I, I strongly recommend doing. Uh, I'll spend some more time talking about ad networks and uh, quality with, uh, with them and sub-ID tracking. So back-end metrics, obviously, even more important. We're all familiar with uh, ARPU and SHURN and LTV and all that kind of stuff. The main point here, from a UA perspective, you got to know, you know, on an average basis with your data, what is an expected value of any given user that signs up for your game. That's going to be your ceiling for what you can spend to acquire a user. Obviously, we'd all like to be in the black there, and we have some space between what the cost is and then what the actual value of the user is. There's been a little bit of back and forth with that, in our experience, definitely on mobile. Uh, but if you guys are you know, in that profitability margin, you got to do some of these uh, back-end metrics to see you know, LTV, cost per acquiring a user, and just make sure that you're in between there. So pretty straightforward stuff. And then the last part about the strategy side of things before actually getting into building a campaign is that you're going to primarily be using content and contextual targeting as the meat of what you're doing because we can't do a lot of audience-based targeting or age targeting, things like that. So to do that, it's important to know who your audience is, what are their interests, what kind of other games are they playing, what toys do they play with, what TV shows are popular, things like that. So then when you're setting up a display campaign or on YouTube, or, for example, then you know what kind of channels to go after, what type of websites to target with your ads. So I'll give you a little bit of background about what's worked for us. Uh, this isn't meant to be a, you know, a use case scenario for everybody. Uh, Animal Jam is a free-to-play game with uh, premium memberships available. So a slightly different uh, monetization model that some of you might be using for your games. Uh, we don't have any in-game advertising. So keep things like that in mind. But just some findings that we've had over the last few years of just navigating the, the user acquisition waters online. So we were just talking before the presentation about creative and its importance. I think this is something that really helps set our brand apart, and it's something that's worth investing some resources in. Uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of artists uh, in our studio that have been with the studio since it was founded, you know, 10 plus years ago, and then have been working on Animal Jam since it started in 2010. So I feel like they've really nailed our style. It's really consistent in everything that we do. Um, and some things that have worked for us with that are you know, swapping out different creative, uh, doing campaigns throughout the year, even simple things like doing seasonal creative. So this one on the right here with the purple fox on the beach is part of a seasonal summer campaign. So just s straightforward things like that. And then along with the banners, so if somebody clicks on that purple fox banner, they get sent to a landing page that has art that matches the, the ad that they just clicked on. So it's a really consistent experience for them. If it's a boy-focused ad versus a girl-focused ad, they're going to go to a boys page. If it's a girls ad, they're going to go to you know, the one that they clicked on for the, for the banner. Uh, just a couple other points about this. Like, this is the entire landing page right here. There's really only one option, which is to you know, play now. Click the green button in the center of the screen. Uh, you can go to the home page if you've been to the site before and you somehow end up here. But you know, very straightforward, you know, fun page, a lot of color happening, a lot of different cool stuff going on. Very clear uh, conversion funnel for us, too. Uh, since we can't do a lot of, or any, remarketing campaigns, which would be kind of our bread and butter for getting people to convert and do different things like sign up and pay for memberships, the way that we work around that is by using creative and placement targeting to use for different goals. So for example, I mentioned we're a free-to-play game with premium memberships available. These are some banners that uh, feature uh, animals and pets and things that are available to paying users. We target these ads on content you know, related to our game. We're confident that people that are on those sites or those YouTube channels already play the game. So here's a little glimpse of what you might get as a member. The call to action is a little bit different. We use join the club instead of our usual play now or play for free. So something that's worked pretty well for us this year. Uh, paid search, obviously, this is a very important part of any UA program. Uh, our findings are the primarily you know, branded keywords are a big part of our strategy there. I know there's a lot of ongoing debate about that. We've certainly had our own uh, internally about it, too, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, but I'd say from my recommendation would be to you know, embrace your branded keywords and also embrace misspellings of those. I've seen probably three or 4,000 variations of misspelled uh, animal jam in different ways. So it's something that's important. Luckily, there's a lot of automation built in now with Google and Bing where they help you kind of recognize and capture those misspellings as, you know, this is what they meant to search for. Let's include that in our bidding. And then the point really here is that this helps maximize your search engine results page real estate. So you know, I think that's especially important for kids. The ads are not as glaringly different from the content uh, for search as they are with display and things like that. But you know, kids are just as savvy as we are as kind of you know, banner blindness and getting rid of that stuff when they're looking. So I think it's important to have as much uh, possible click real estate there. 
Uh, on the note about the branded keywords, we had this ongoing internal debate. We actually ended up pausing the campaign for a couple of weeks just to see, you know, are we going to lose more than we're going to gain? And we did find, you know, we did see most of that traffic convert into our organic results instead, but we actually lost more sessions than we would have otherwise gotten. So it was about a 4% difference in the traffic that clicked through when we had both uh, organic and paid listings versus just the organic. So that's what we found out there. Uh, YouTube, I mentioned before, this is a very important channel for us. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of our, our kids are kind of on the older side of the spectrum, too. We have some famous players that they love to watch their videos and, you know, play net, let's play gameplay videos, things like that. So primarily it involves uh, content targeting. So we're looking at, uh, for like our membership conversion campaigns, Animal Jam related sites, uh, placements, things like that. And then in addition to that, you know, what are the other interests that the kids have? Uh, finding some, you know, YouTube personalities that they really like, you know, the toy unboxing videos are huge now, so there's a lot of time spent doing things like that. So just understanding what is your audience interested in, and then just simply targeting those placements uh, in your YouTube campaigns. So we do, you know, this includes both the display, like the 728 by 90 banner here. We also have a pre-roll that we use for, you know, TV commercials that we also run on YouTube as well. I think it's important to use both. Um, Obviously, the banners get a lot more volume. The pre roll is a little bit more expensive to run, but it's good to have both in conjunction. Uh, ad networks in our CPA program. So this is a really important strategy for us. Um, my advice here is that it's very important to have you know, good communication, good rapport. A lot of these networks are they're gaming focused, but they're not always uh, kid focused. So understanding that you know, as a COPA compliant uh, uh, game, we need to make sure we're following restrictions and that we can't use behavioral targeting, remarketing, or things like that that might be, you know, really important for their other clients. So just having a good rapport back and forth about, you know, what's involved with the campaign and the targeting. Um, establishing CPAs based on the expected value of a registration I mentioned, so just making sure that you're in that, the profitability margin there. And then the sub-ID quality is very important. This is something that I actually started doing uh, weekly reports uh, about this. So since the ad networks are, are offering the, uh, the campaign out to a bunch of different smaller websites, it's important to be able to, even if it's on an anonymous level, track the results between each of those so we can give good optimization feedback back to them saying like, you know, site one, two, three is you know, converting about 5%, but these guys are doing 15%. Let's get more traffic from them. So this has been really helpful for us. We do weekly uh, quality reports. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing more uh, automated uh, quality tracking with like, you know, player retention rates, uh, time spent in the game, uh, play time is very important for us. So once a user, instead of just converting on the site, you know, they hit a threshold of having played for 15 or 20 minutes, then it's like, okay, great, that's good traffic for us. Let's keep doing that kind of stuff. So these things have worked really well for us. And these are a few of the networks that we work with down here if anybody's interested. Uh, just a quick note about this. Uh, this is more of a, an engagement strategy as opposed to a, a straight user acquisition strategy. But I've just I found it's been really important to engage your community and make sure that you're you know make them feel heard and that you're featuring things that they're putting online. We have a lot of great artists in our community. You know, although a lot of them are kids, they have incredibly <laughs> incredible art skills. You know, whether it's using our kind of archaic you know paint-like tool on the bottom there. Uh, which they're making these great masterpieces out of, or it's you know, using their own third-party programs or sculpting something out of clay, things like that. So we feature these on our Instagram. We do contests for the kids. We'll do giveaways if they uh, you know, get featured on our, our channel, things like that. So not really a straight UA program, but it's something that's been really helpful for us for engagement. Of course, it wouldn't be complete without talking about what hasn't worked for us because we've had a lot of findings in both directions. So I wanted to share some of our, you know, we'll call them learning opportunities that we've had. So grow now, monetize later. So this really came into play for us last year. I mentioned we started expanding uh, globally a lot more as opposed to focusing on just our real core profitable tier one markets. So while we found that you know, in countries and regions like Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and then in Southeast Asia, primarily the Philippines, Indonesia, we had great reactions from players there. They loved the game, they were playing. We got you know, equal play times as we did in the US and Canada but it's a free-to-play game, obviously, they're like, great, we're going to play, we'll play for hours a day, but we just didn't see monetization out of them. So, you know, maybe that's something down the road that we look into an ad monetization strategy as opposed to just our usual free-to-play, you know, kind of premium model that we're using, but just wanted to share our findings there. Uh, in both cases, really easy to get user volume, easy to spend a lot of money, easy to get a lot of registrations, not easy to, to monetize those registrations. 
Uh, this is a tough one, kind of. CPM-based digital buys. So we do, like I mentioned, some offline buying. And I think it's really important to do branding when you have really good artwork and consistent uh, brand awareness like we do. Online, it's been a little bit harder for us to do these kind of things when we still have you know, a direct response based metrics and traffic available to us. So whether that's clicks or acquisitions, it's, just, it's been tough to kind of uh, bake in CPM based digital buys into that strategy as well. So something I think that will come to play more down the road as the volume becomes available. And I'll spend a little bit of time about that in a second. Uh, mobile, I know most of you here probably are you know, mobile first or at least mobile focused. Uh, a lot of our audience is starting to shift from our uh, flash based browser game to our mobile game. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. Our UA has been relatively limited there so far, but we do have some findings I wanted to share. So our game, our mobile game came out about a year ago. Uh, it's a similar model to our web game where it's free to play. You know, instead of a subscription, it's got uh, IAPs that are available. There are a limited number of IAPs. You know, we try to treat them as toys, basically. So if a kid buys something, it's theirs forever. It's theirs to keep. It's not something that we gate or you know, keep them from accessing content of the game without paying. So that being said, we have set a kind of a ceiling for ourselves with how much we can monetize. So it's kind of played into our UA program and something that we're keeping in mind as we start to ramp that up. Um, so just a few notes. And this is you know, maybe a little bit of a no-brainer, but it's something that came up internally. So Make sure that you're using an actual uh, established attribution platform as opposed to trying to build a homegrown system, something that one of our developers suggested that we do. Uh, luckily, we were able to talk them out of it and go with an existing platform. You know, I love mobile because of the integrations and how easy it is to work with so many different networks and test and track and events and conversions are so easy to set up. So don't try to reinvent the wheel there. Um, just like online, make sure you're determining your marketing objective prior to launching a campaign. Something that was a little bit more of a gray area for us as we were starting out because we didn't have the same kind of metrics that we do online. So whether it's you're trying to get your app in the top five or ten in a category, whether you're trying to do you know an ROI positive straight UA campaign on CPI basis, whatever it is, just make sure that that's established up front. So you know, kind of simple marketing one on one. Make sure you've got an objective and a goal in mind. And then so far for us, at least, video has worked best. We've tried a few different uh, display platforms as well. So the you know, interstitials, a few banners, things like that. Uh, I think video has the most volume. This is you know, mostly rewarded videos. Uh, so, so far, that's, that's been kind of our best bet. But like I mentioned, it's been a relatively limited UA program for us so far. And then just a couple of notes about looking ahead, things I wanted to mention. Um, I mentioned before that we're seeing that continuing shift from TV into digital, both from a consumer perspective where kids are spending more time on their devices as opposed to just watching on TV. Obviously, that's going to involve a, a change for ad dollars as well. So it's going to be continually important for us to focus on the digital side of things going forward. And then kids safe social and video. I think we'll see a lot more of this popping up in the future. I think this will become a, a bigger part of ours and others' uh, user acquisition programs. So these are things like uh, Pop Jam, which is a kid safe social network that uh, Super Awesome acquired a couple years ago from Mind Candy in the UK. Uh, so these are going to be like very moderated, whitelisted, kid safe uh, social channels. I think a lot of the opportunities will be more influencer based and, and branded content as opposed to straight ad buys, uh, but something I think that will be part of our program going forward. And on that same note, uh, KidSafe ad network. So I mentioned it's been tough for us to do the CPM-based buys because it's hard to do, you know, we're, we're trying to back things out to a cost for registration regardless of how we buy the media. So when the, we're trying to buy on a CPM basis, it just makes it a little bit tougher. I think as more volume becomes available and these networks start to grow a little bit more, we'll see the same thing we did on the consumer side of things with ad networks where it's like, okay, we don't have to do a direct sales model anymore where we're buying just on CPM. We can automate things a little bit more. We can do a little bit more cost per click, cost per acquisition based uh, media. So I'm looking forward to that happening. I'm sure we all are. It'll be a little bit more efficient for everybody. Uh, I think we're where the, the EU legislation or GDPR. So this is the European version of COPA, which has been kind of cooking for a couple of years now. Uh, it'll go into effect in May 2018. A lot of companies are already working on becoming compliant. I'm sure a lot of you are as well. So probably starting earlier than, than later uh, is going to be our plan as well. So it'll be similar to COPA, a little bit heavier restrictions in some cases about how parents are opting in and deciding to allow their kids' information to be shared. Uh, so th this will be something that's important to keep in mind going forward as well. And so that's it. Thank you. Like I mentioned, I've got uh, some giveaways here. We have a toy line that just came out. So I'll be taking any questions and be happy to answer them for you guys. Um, 
was kind of interesting at the, at the very end there about the uh, the EU um, coming down the pipe. So currently, right now, your uh, your audience, what percentage is U.S. based versus rest of world? And then also on the mobile piece, I didn't notice anything about like app install ads. Are you using any of those tactics, like on Facebook, for example? And what kind of success have you seen there? Sure. So first part, which how much of our audience is U.S. based versus international? I want to say it's about. 70 to 75 percent U.S. based, and we're seeing that kind of continuing to grow overseas. Um, like primarily Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, you know, tier one English speaking markets. Uh, we have expanded a little bit more outside of that. And then app install ads, are you talking about like us like running within our app? So it's something that we actually uh, don't as kind of a matter of policy right now. We do have some other IP, um, another app called Tunnel Town that's not just targeted at kids. It's not considered a COPA compliant app. And we do some rewarded videos there. It's done well for us, um, but it's not part of our monetization strategy right now. Honestly, we've just been fortunate that we haven't you know, had to go that direction yet, but it's something that we'll keep in mind down the road for sure. And don't normally uh, forget. So this is our blind boxes. I'll let you pick one if you want. We got a, a few different ones here. These are our new adopt a pet line. Thank you. Yes? Hiya. Um, I wanted to ask, just going back to that creative about the join the community, if the user was to click on that, how would you know where to take them? Would, does it take them to uh, uh, the, the registrate or the upgrade page or just to a regular sign-in page or is it like a dual option page? You're talking about a creative that's for the membership yeah. conversion? So yeah, those ones actually drive to our membership page. Okay. So but tip, go ahead. But if one of those was, but if I see that and I'm not already signed up even, because you said there could be a chance that those creatives being served, then, then what happens? So you know that, that's kind of another bit of the crippling pieces where we don't have that ability to segment audiences where normally I just pixel those people that I know they're playing the game already. I serve them this specific ad. So of course we can't do that. So there's going to be some duplication of efforts. Some people that have not heard of the game might end up clicking on a banner that sends them to our membership page without having interacted with the site before. So we do see some of that. I think it just kind of goes with the program, but unfortunately for targeting you know, a kid-based game. Why are, you, why are you subject uh, to COPA uh, versus, for example, Candy Crush that a lot of other kids play? Why do you need to comply to COPA more than other games that also kids uh, need to play? So I think th the question is why do we need to uh, comply with COPA versus other games that kids play but are not necessarily going after kids directly? I think it's something that we've really embraced the challenge there and the field has kind of shrunk a lot for other companies that are willing to do that. So a lot of other, I think, you know, game studios have kind of just buried their heads in the sand a little bit saying, yeah, maybe, you know, a bunch of our audience are kids or even on social media channels. They just, you know, they were saying, if you, if you want to use our platform on Facebook, you got to be 13 or over, sorry. You know, of course, kids don't always abide by that, right? So I think what we're doing is really embracing the challenge head on and saying, yeah, we're, we're going after kids. Our, our audience is them. So we're going to make sure that we do everything we need to do to comply with COPA. And as a result, it, there's not as much competition right now. Is that any clear question? Yeah, how, how do you when, you, do, when you have registration to the clubs, how do you ensure that the parents uh, allow registration? Yeah, so uh, obviously it's part of our compliance with COPA. So during the registration process, uh, any players are required to enter a parent email. So then a notification gets sent to them. If we don't hear back or if the parent doesn't confirm that it's okay for their kid to be playing the game, then we're obligated to delete their account within what's defined as a reasonable amount of time by COPA. So it's part of our opt-in process. Do you know that this is the parent and not to the friend? Yeah, unfortunately that's not something that, that we're able to, uh, to regulate. There's not an age gap uh, on signing up for Gmail or anything like that. So you know, we're, we're doing everything we, everything we can to comply with the, the restrictions that are in place, but you know, we, we do what we can. Um, this is probably a little bit different, but I'm curious, um, based on his little prize, what's your relationship, uh, what's the partnership with National Geographic? Sure, yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. So uh, the game is produced you know, in, par in partnership with Nat Geo. So what we, we primarily do is do a lot of content sharing. So I didn't talk about it because it's mostly you know, UA-focused presentation, but we do a lot of educational content as well. Uh, we have a marine biologist there, uh, a herpetologist that we get videos from. So the game has a lot of animal facts and things like that. So we're fortunate that we get access to a lot of their content library, a lot of things they're producing about animals and things like that. So it's worked out well for both of us. Um, I think you know, as we continue to grow, it's good for them to have the exposure as well. Yes. 
And don't forget to come up and grab your. Uh, I know this this isn't a UA question, but um, what's your plan with the the impending death of Flash? That's a great question. Uh, I think the hope. Because I love your site, and I w <laughs> I'm going to be really sad if it dies. But I don't, yeah. and I don't want it to die. We have no plans of dying. Um, so I think the the mobile platform in Unity, I think, is going to be Plan B. And if things end up going that direction, if that becomes successful and continues to catch on as it has then that's going to kind of be the primary uh, focus for us. I don't know what our plans are to, to port you know, our existing game from Flash to HTML5 or things like that. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure that's something that we have in the works right now, but we do at least have the, uh, the mobile version of the game that's been developed in conjunction. So don't worry. You know, yes, we'll have it covered. <laughs> don't forget your... Uh, yeah. uh, thanks for the talk. Absolutely. Um, I was curious, since you know that your target market, um, it's primarily girls, mm -hmm. but you mentioned that you have girls and boys ads. Yes. How do you decide when to run the boys ads and how much to devote to that since you know that your core is actually girls? Yeah, our core is definitely girls. So with that being said, we don't want to leave the boys completely in the dark. So like I said, with the researching of you know, what, what are their interests, what are the things that they, you know, what other games are they playing, Minecraft channels, things like that. So when we have an idea that you know the other game or the placement that we're targeting on YouTube is going to be really boy focused, then we have we have some boy creative. And obviously the game does include a lot of you know there's gender neutral things to do. There's a lot of stuff for boys as well. We have you know platforming adventures and things like that. So we just want to make sure that we have you know experiences that are appropriate for both audiences. So we try to incorporate both. What is the experience the uh, lifetime value of the What's our LTV? Yeah. I don't know that I can share uh, here today, unfortunately. Um, but I, like I mentioned, I think it's really important to establish that. And then not only that, but with us being a free-to-play game, taking not only your LTV, but then your conversion rate. And then the more important number, I think, is the expected value of a registration, which is just conversion rate times LTV. So whether it's $4, $5, uh, that's what you really need to work towards. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, and those that ask Thank questions, you. don't forget your freebie. Yes, please. Don't forget your freebie.